Minister of Niger Delta Affairs, Godwin Pabio, has submitted the final report of the forensic audit of the Niger Delta Development Commission to President Muhammadu Buhari. The report was received by the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Owa Kamalami, who represented the President. Apabio says the forensic audit covers a total of 13,777 contracts awarded from 2001 to 2019 at a final contract value of more than 3 trillion naira. The President requested for the forensic audit in 2019 and appointed F. Young Orca as the new head of the agency after sacking of the then acting managing director of the commission, Akeme Brokomo Ponde. Ponde got the boot after allegations of mismanaging the agency's funds. The old board of the NDDC was dissolved in January 2020 and a new one is yet to be constituted. So finally, we've got this forensic audit report. That's a big deliverable there for mm. the President Mohamedou. Um, Buhari administration and we've been told by the president that once he has this forensic report then the NDCC um, substantive board that has already been okay, approved. Okay, just hold on a bit, I, I hear we just need to get some actuality to that. Oh, okay. Yeah. The intention of this exercise is not to wish on anybody or any organization. The intention had always been to correct the wrongs of, of the past. From 1958, the federal government of Nigeria had tried to develop the Niger Delta region from one agency to the other. The last but one was the Unpalek, and they tried their best, but they still ended up in the same way. None was able to satisfy the yearnings of the people. None was able to meet up with the challenges that were placed before it. So today, the few forensic auditors have completed the exercise. It wouldn't have been possible but for the doggedness of the security team. So I salute all of you. It is evident that considerable resources have been channeled by the federal government to the development of the Niger Delta from 2001 to 2019. It is therefore important for the federal government and the public to be properly informed of what has been spent and how that has been spent. The essence of the forensic audit is to ensure probity and accountability in the use of public funds. All right. Sorry about that. Back to you, Tundu. Yeah. I've lost my train of thought. Where was I? I think, yeah, so um, President Buhari has said that when he gets the forensic audit report, then the NDDC board that has been confirmed can be inaugurated because, you know, there's been a lot of controversy mm. about that. But so far, what we've heard from this audit report is actually really disheartening. The staggering number of abandoned projects, there are over 13,000, the six trillion naira that's been pumped into the NDDC, with precious little to show for it. Mm. By now, the Niger Delta should be some kind of Shangri-La mm. with that amount of money. But of course, we all know the environmental degradation continues, unemployment, infrastructural deficit, the list goes on. So it's actually extremely upsetting. And then the other issue for me is that the audit report not only points out anomalies, it also makes recommendations. And the problem with rec recommendations that we've seen with the Rossani report, other reports, is that they're just not implemented. Yes. So I just hope that this bucks that trend. Otherwise, what's the point? This um, committee, this, um, the auditors, were appointed in February of 2020, and they've taken all this time to produce this report. For goodness sake, I just hope it's not a wasted effort and it's actually implemented to the letter for a change. Dr. Bati? Well, I think it's a, a, um, a very commendable development that at last the Buhari administration has reached this point and has made an effort to audit whatever is going on with, uh, you know, uh, the focus on the marginalization of the Niger Delta. And it goes back all the way to 1958 with the setting up of the Willings Commission. 1958, just before independence, the uh, minorities in Nigeria in the uh, Niger Delta region talked about marginalization. So the Willings Commission made specific recommendations as to how the interests of those communities, oil-bearing communities, can be addressed. By 1959, the Willings Commission submitted its report, and that was what led to the provision for derivation and all of that in the 1960-1963 Constitution. Down the line, we had UMPADEC, 
the oil minerals producing uh, uh, agency, uh, development agency uh, commission. And then the successor to UMPADEC, which is also the uh, Niger Data Development Commission. I think it's a great embarrassment that many years after 1958, the people of the Niger Data, oil bearing communities across uh, the South South, continue to complain about the lack of development, about marginalization in the areas. And that is why the audit that was ordered uh, by uh, President Buhari, Mohamed Buhari, in 2019. Uh, I think was a good development. The interest of the administration is in probity and accountability. And since 2019, uh, when President Buhari ordered that, uh, you know, audit, there have been many, you know, uh, issues, including fainting spells, including uh, conflict between uh, stakeholders and the federal government, including all kinds of embarrassing revelations about how people just collect contracts and they do not... Uh, uh, you know, deliver, including conflicts on the floor of the National Assembly investigating oversight uh, committees. They treated us to a lot of comedy, a lot of drama. But here we are, at last, a report has been provided by the lead auditor, and uh, lead forensic auditor, and the uh, 16 or 17 other audit firms that were engaged in this. Why that lasted? The federal government insisted that it would not set up another board because it needed to get to the root of the matter. This may well end up as a, a major achievement uh, for President Buhari and as part of his uh, construction, which he talked about, of his legacy, you know, uh, uh, two days ago uh, this week. But how do they go about it? There are a number of issues that have emerged. One is that, look, about three, uh, is it 300,000? What was that figure you quoted? What, 13,722? Okay, the over 13,777 contracts cannot be accounted for. Now, between uh, uh, 2001 and 2019, that, that covered, the government spent 3.9 trillion that cannot be accounted for. In the course of the, uh, of the audit, 77 contractors suddenly rushed to site and completed the 77 uh, route uh, projects. Out of 13,777, we're told that in a period of about 18 years, Nigeria spent about 6 trillion. 6 trillion cannot be uh, accounted for in real terms. But I'm more interested in the recommendations of the lead auditor, Kabir Ahmed. They say his name is. You know, Kabir Ahmed was saying that, look, going forward, the federal government of Nigeria must downsize the board of NDDC. It should not be job for the boys. It should not be a position where a governor sends his uh, most incompetent favorite to go and help him uh, look after contracts. Two, it should be a part-time assignment. Three, the IOCs, the uh, oil companies, should be uh, made to pay their own contribution. Four, the FIRS should collect the contribution of the federal government and give to the NDDC uh, directly from the, uh, collect the, uh, 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 their own share of, of uh, input directly from the uh, oil companies. I think that these are important recommendations, but what is more important is that the president has made it very clear that anybody who is found guilty of having collected Nigerian money to put into private accounts will be sanctioned. 362 accounts being operated over a period of 18 years by the NDDC. And the minister, Gosulu Pabio, I think he also deserves commendation, said that most of those uh, you know, uh, uh, proceeds or the money meant for NDDC, meant for the development in the Niger Delta area, went to private accounts. Those private accounts should be identified. We're in the age of uh, BVN. And finally, let nobody from the Niger Delta come around and say, uh, leave whoever took our money alone because it's our money. No, it's not about their money. It's about governance. It's about accountability. And that, I think, is what, uh, you know, President Buhari is interested in. But uh, the Buhari administration also should also go about it expeditiously yeah. and in a transparent manner, considering that the government now faces the challenge of time. But yeah. so far, so good in this regard. We commend everyone that is involved. And you can't offer a mic when it comes to talking about the Niger Delta. We'll keep talking about the Niger Delta right here. Take a short break when we return. We have Rose Zuduri, Michael Wilson, and Aaron Akirjala to give you updates about Africa Global Business, what activities across the globe. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Our dependable Rotus Adiri is here to give us an African business update. Good morning, Rotus. Good morning, Tundu. This is the first time I'm going to comment on your fashion. You, you really do look ravishing this morning. Oh, uh, good, morning, too kind. good morning, Doctor. Good morning, Rufai. Good yeah. morning to uh, Rotus. Uh, <laughs> I know you I'm want to join the them. I'm joining them. <laughs> <Tundu is just laughs> you want to join the poor? I use Tundu's uh, 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 profile pic on my Instagram when I'm promoting my videos, ah. my African yeah. business update yeah. videos yes. on wow. Instagram. Wow. So that's yeah. Uh, getting more followers now because of Tundu. Well, All right, real quick, let's get into the, <laughs> get into today's uh, stories. The NMPC, we started the NMPC. Um, this is nothing new. Uh, Garba Mohammed, who's the spokesperson for the NMPC, said he was quoting Melek Hiari, who was at a uh, meeting with the uh, Joint Committee on uh, the Medium-Term Expenditure Framework for 2022 through 2025 at the National Assembly, that price differentials, arbitrage is what is pushing uh, smuggling. Which is interesting, right? Because Bella Chiari did get, had a meeting with uh, security operatives, customs, um, the DSS, and so on, on the, off, on the um, instruction of the president um, to try to curtail fuel smuggling. So, and then even in your exclusive interview with President Buhari, where you brought this up, the, the whole issue of, um, of subsidy payments, and President Buhari just focused only on the fact that there was smuggling and something needs to be done. So they got all these security operatives and they got together to address smuggling, yet the issue, um, the, the real symptom here, the real cause of this issue is price. And what the NMPC is, is saying now, or not now, they've been pushing this thing for a while, but reiterating that if you address the difference in price in Nigeria and in neighboring countries, you will end smuggling. Will anyone bring this up to the president and put it directly in front of him and say, this is the issue? That's, that's of course, what we have to focus on. From uh, oil and gas, we go to um, agriculture, spices. Uh, AgriCorp International is a spice um, processing and export company. They raise uh, $17.5 million in Series A funding, Nigerian-based company. Um, they're trying to close the gap. That's uh, Kenneth uh, Obiajulu, who is uh, the co-founder of, uh, of the company. Um, Essentially, what they're trying to do is to meet up with the, the gap. So Nigeria is the third largest uh, exporter of, of ginger, for instance, uh, in the world. Yet we have a production capacity of 31 million metric tons, but there's like a, a demand of about 65 million uh, metric tons or so. So there's a large uh, gap there. Also, Nigeria accounts for about 16% of global um, ginger production, but only has about 4% of global market market share. So there's a large gap that needs to be met in terms of export proceeds, foreign exchange earnings uh, from this particular, um, uh, from spices. So that's what AgriCorp International is trying to do, in a sense, to trying to close that gap. And so uh, they, this, uh, this, the investors who have put funding in, in the, joined in this $17.5 million funding, they see a future here. So a lot of potential for, um, for uh, Nigeria in terms of spice exports. Uh, we move to ride hailing. Uh, Bolt um, is trying to promote PVC collection. So apparently if uh, you get on bolts, they're, do, they're offering discounted rides uh, to PVC locations. And when I saw this, I don't really, you know, I, mean, I already have my PVC, but I mean, they, they, as far as corporations trying to push Nigerians to get voting, I think this is only the first, I can't remember the other corporation I saw that did this, but only one, oh, they're, they're very few, they're very few. So again, this is just something I saw a couple days ago, a reminder from both Nigeria that Nigerians should take voting seriously and they're doing their best to discount rise in order to get to uh, PVC locations. Uh, sports finance, the uh, uh, NFF, the uh, Football Federation, signed a 500 million Naira uh, deal with, uh, with MTN Nigeria. And and uh, Amaju Pinnick uh, said that this, of course, is going to push uh, the NFF towards self self-funding. Uh, you know, we've got Qatar 2022 coming up, we've got qualifications uh, for Nigeria coming up, and there's, you know, it's very, very important that, uh, there you see Amaju Pinnick and uh, Carl Torella, who is the CEO of MTN Nigeria, shaking hands there at the signing. I think this is at the Marriott in Ikeja. Uh, and so, Funding is very, very crucial for our, you know, for the region. So, and it's important that in order to get funding ahead, you've got to sign these deals with uh, corporations. So, this was, uh, I believe, uh, just yesterday or the day before. Then, um, okay, Thursday. Well, this is on Thursday. On Wednesday, they also signed a 300 million naira deal with Airpeace. Airpeace is now the official 
carrier uh, for not only the uh, Super Eagles, but also other um, uh, uh, football uh, teams uh, in, uh, in Nigeria. Alan Oyema, who's the CEO, there he is signing off with uh, Maju Pinnick. That was on Wednesday also at the Marriott. He did make the point that, yeah, it's, we're glad to be supporting the Super Eagles, but he said we also, and crucial point, there needs to be funding at the club level. For, the, for, for the, uh, the, the Nigerian clubs, the football clubs, because that's supposed to be the funnel through which you get the talented players that will end up playing for the, for the um, Super Eagles. So, again, for corporations to come in and want to invest in local sports in Nigeria, there's got to be a return on investment. So ticket prices might have to go up. Finally, um, Pakistan and Kenya uh, have uh, resolved a long-running tariff issue with respect to uh, I- I- tariffs on Kenyan tea going into Pakistan. Uh, they finally resolved its trade is going to resume between the two nations and Kenyan tea when we just talked about ginger a few minutes ago and export proceeds for Nigeria Kenya's imports in 2020 from Pakistan amounted to about 200 million dollars Going the other way, Kenyan exports to Pakistan was over $500 million. So this definitely benefits Kenya more than it does uh, Pakistan. And again, it just goes to show the importance of having a diversified uh, export basket when okay. it comes to, to, to that. Okay, Roxy, you can say that all over again. And that's what we, we, we look forward to a day where we'll have that in Nigeria, trade surplus. Yes. You know, against a country like uh, Pakistan or probably China. Yeah, it's possible. Anything is possible. Looks like... Uh, Impossible now, but it's possible. Mm. And that's why we should constantly churn out things. We should have products. It should not just be crude oil. I remember when they started at Goa, Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, a couple of years back. After some time, we're not churning out products. All we're doing was to use our Goa to ship out crude oil. And that's not the case. That's not what a Goa was started for. So we should look at possibilities where we can actually churn out products. And that's why I'm happy about AgriCorp. Because spice is a big deal. You remember, one of the reasons why the colonizers came to Africa in the first place was because of spice. Right. They came to check through the spice route, Cape of Good Hope, that's how they got into South Africa. Correct. One of the biggest companies then, you know, was a spice-making company, you know, the, the East uh, Indian Holding Company and the likes of some other companies. They traded in spice. They came to Africa because of spice. They came to look for spice. And it's still a big deal. We have a big market in ginger. We've got a big market with sesame seeds. Indeed. Nigeria churns out a lot of sesame seeds. We've got a big market with gum arabic. You know, gum arabic is a major constituent for the fizzy drink, the black fizzy drink we, we drink all, everybody drinks all over the world. Yep. The major binding constituent is gum arabic. And gum arabic is in Boruna, some other parts of Nigeria. Nigeria can make billions Wait, what did you say, Bornu? Yeah. Well, what's happening in Bornu? What's happening in Bornu? And, and that's why, there you go. And, that's and, why you and, can't. And, and, and this right. company, I don't just want to say the name I of this know, company, know, know. needs a lot of gum arabic because you can't have that fizzy drink without gum arabic. So we need to do a lot to show up trade potential and more investment should come into the agri space. We could show up the potential. We've not even scratched the surface yet. It's, it, it shouldn't be about only corporate production, but it should be about packaging of our products. We've got a lot of sesame seeds wasting out of the north, gum arabic wasting out of the north, and we can just ship these things out and well, first, have an exciting uh, The sports story that you brought up, I think we should commend uh, Alan Oyama, uh, specifically the chairman of Airpeace. This is the second time he's stepping forward uh, to support Nigeria, to support sovereign interests. He did so when we had uh, that xenophobic uh, incident in South, South Africa. Africa right. uh, many Nigerians were in dire straits, and he put down aircraft uh, from his fleet, the airpiece fleet, to evacuate uh, Nigerians from uh, South Africa. And he did it without collecting a penny. Uh, he did it out of uh, patriotism. In this particular case, the Nigerian Football Federation has also been having challenges. Uh, the other time, uh, Maju Pinnick and other officials were telling us that because of COVID-19, uh, it was very difficult to sustain funding. Uh, some of the uh, bodies, uh, you know, funding some of the uh, tournaments uh, could not keep, keep up. But now we have, you know, uh, Airpeace again through Alan Oyama coming in with uh, a promise of uh, $300 million. 200 million will be provided, 100 million will be provided in terms of value in kind. The contract, uh, if you like, the agreement is uh, for one year, renewable over a period of four years. And Alan Oyama says he's not doing it just because of the hard work that he has seen, but because it is important at this time of difficulties to give our people hope. And I like that phrase, you know, about giving people hope. And this is coming from the private sector, CSR, 
right? And uh, Amaju Pinnick uh, came forward and said, well, now the NFF can do self-funding up to 75%. I think that the challenge is for other private sector big players to step into the, into the gap and help to provide that remaining 25%. What we have seen with football in, in particular is that we have great talent. We have people all over the world. And if you can have a strong football federation in Nigeria, if you can have more Allen Oyamas throwing their heart into the ring to provide that support, that will help a lot uh, in great deal. So uh, congratulations to both Amaju Pinnick and Allen Oyama and those others who we like think will step Nigeria. into yes. it. Well, I don't want to yeah. put anybody on the spot, but I think other stakeholders should move into it. As right. for smuggling and the arbitrage, that uh, Mele Kiari was talking about when he was talking to the Joint Committee uh, of the National Assembly on, uh, on uh, fiscal strategy going forward, 22 to 2024. Well, it's not enough to complain about smuggling. The challenge is what sh should government do? What is government doing? Why are they not doing it? So since they know what the problem is. So it's not enough to go again to the National Assembly and say, this is the problem we face. Moralizing about it, will not solve the problem. But we have the Dangote refinery coming on stream. We hope that by the time the Dangote refinery comes on stream, some of these problems will be addressed. Well, I'd also like to add to what you said about Alain Oyema. He's just such a patriot. You said it all. And Amadou Pinnick as well. Kudos to him. It's good to see somebody have a goal and pursue it to the end. And we do hope that the NFF is 100% self-sufficient. Now, about tea, you know, some of these topics, I find it so depressing. I read it. Yes. Okay. I read it and I thought about Mambila Plateau in um, Taraba State, where we have so many tea farmers and yet another under-exploited resource in Nigeria. We could be doing huge things with tea in this country and we simply don't the one that kills me is strawberries in plateau in just, states yeah. strawberries nigeria can be and they've complained there the farmers there that they don't have the route to market you can just you can it's i mean we're so that diverse climate, that climate there yeah. just you know can we can do so much so with much it. nigeria's export potential as far as diversifying is massive but mm -hmm. you know we just have to sort out a lot of issues insecurity and uh and, and, you know other in, uh, infrastructure that's what we have to get sorted out well thank you for your time this morning rotis Moving on to more business updates, Michael Wilson joins us now from London. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Good morning. Uh, everything really paused before the non-payroll figures coming out, or non-farm payroll figures coming out of the United States, uh, round about 1.30 our time and your time too. Uh, and so nothing really happening apart from that. But however, there's been a lot of action as far as the Asia-Pacific markets are concerned, not least of which is the Prime Minister of Japan, uh, Mr. Suga saying that uh, he's going to bow out of the leadership race for the party. Now, only yesterday we were talking, were we not, about efforts to reboot the Japanese economy. A lot of the plans that he'd actually put into place would have actually helped that. But he's going. Uh, or it says he's not going to stand again. Something to do for his handling of the COVID situation in Japan, apparently, with the Olympic Games and so on. But the fact of the matter is that's all the past. The future is where the Japanese economy is actually going. And uh, it's still very somnambulant. He wants to he wanted to increase productivity, wanted green stuff going and so on, wanted to get more people into work. That apparently is not going to happen. Um, China, Japan, uh, and Australia, their, their, their PMI is disappointed, really, um, and uh, they, they've, missed, they've missed quite a lot. All it will take now is a large-scale outbreak of COVID in China for mass lockdowns. That's another potentially gruesome headwind, um, which may be hitting the markets fairly soon, U.S. jobs figures notwithstanding. Um, the latest target of China's uh, tech blitz, I said yesterday, I thought it might be the health sector. I was wrong. It turns out to be algorithms. Um, the increasingly uh, powerful cybersecurity regulator um, is, is going to uh, clamp down on algorithms. This is a sort of technology that helps China's largest tech companies like Alibaba, TikTok and ByteDance to, to build up their multi-billion dollar businesses. The world is watching this, no question about that. And if this happens to work and this clampdown happens to work across big tech, then it may be something that other countries want to do. China is also, it appears, going to open a new stock exchange. Um, 
the president said this the new share market will be in Beijing. Um, there's one in Shanghai and there's one in Shenzhen. But the one in Beijing, it does. How does this actually? How does this relate to common prosperity that he's been talking about in the communist system? No idea. But anyway, that's what he's actually saying. Um, and the China Securities Regulatory Commission said it was excited at the prospect. So you can imagine that it will be regulated there. So the United States then, and as I said to you, the jobs figures is the most important thing um, a long time. It will actually show investors which way the Fed is probably likely to go. Um, if it's not too bad, if it's not too high, then it will be buy everything and sell the US dollar and vice versa. US equity markets headed slightly higher uh, overnight. Um, the S&P rose about a quarter of a percent, the Dow about a third of a percent. Um, so basically, everything really halted in front of that. After that, we get very interesting prospects um, in the in in Europe. We get the ECB meeting uh, next week, which, as I was saying to you yesterday, inflation is creeping up quite dramatically in in Europe, and the ECB will have to make up its mind as to whether it's temporary or whether it's actually going to do anything positive um, about it. A lot of a lot of th th we suspect there'll be a lot of table slapping at the meeting next week particularly from Germany. Remember, political uh, elections taking place there in the not too distant future, Angela Merkel going. And the German view is, why should we, as the voice of stability in the largest economy in Europe, be paying for other people to come out of the pandemic? Um, as far as the UK is concerned, staycations actually helped shoppers get back into shops and so on. It doesn't, it's footfalls up about 10%. That's the measure of people actually going through doors. It doesn't mean to say that retailers got over its problems yet. And doesn't mean to say that um, online won't continue, but it's nice to have people actually going back to high streets and so on. And finally, um, as oil, as far as oil is concerned, a bit of a rally um, after after the OPEC plus meeting brought no surprises. Gold, well, very much on hold at the moment. But again, all this could change with those U.S. jobless figures, which are coming out this lunchtime. That's I mean, the global view. Michael, how in the world are lorry drivers now to earn sixty thousand pounds a year? How is that going to happen? Really? That's one. Two, Philip Hammond has got his hand in the cookie jar again. Can't these former chancellors in the UK just stay out of bad press with all of their meddling in businesses? Uh, uh, are you saying that lorry drivers shouldn't be well paid? Because I think they should be well paid. I think they have a horrible job. Um, they, they work between 10 and 12 hours a day, certainly in the UK. Um, they are restricted to using the toilet facilities in, uh, in service stations. They're not allowed to wash. They often have to sleep in their cabs. And they've decided to stay in this country and earn a lot of money because there's a shortage. It's straight market demands. That's why they're getting paid a lot. So if, you know, if that's what the market demands, then they will get paid $60,000 a year, £60,000 a year, or indeed $6,000 a year. Why shouldn't they? get paid a lot they're doing a vital job supply chains are absolutely important maybe what we're seeing is a reversal in some people who weren't thought of as being important now be now being very important indeed as far as politicians uh getting into business and so on and meddling after they've been in power absolutely with you on that i think they should sign something to say that once they go they go and they have to have a certain amount of time before they're allowed to be consultants again i did actually think there were rules about that no doubt whatever philip hammond's done will be investigated well michael a short comment first on uh, the issue of drivers the uh, hgv drivers uh, that the british retail commission has been uh, talking about saying that there's a shortage of drivers Yesterday, there was a meeting of the uh, British uh, uh, Retail and Business uh, Trade and uh, Business Commission, including representatives of business and some MPs. And the British Retail Commission was saying that the government, whether it likes it or not, will have to take a second look at immigration policies with regard to drivers. Because there is a backlog uh, of persons who have to take uh, driving tests, and they want to be given the opportunity to recruit drivers from elsewhere, parts of Europe, possibly perhaps also from Nigeria, so that you don't have the kind of disruption that the United Kingdom is facing at the moment. But the government is saying no. Look at indigenous drivers. And then, of course, the response is that it's not only a shortage of drivers that we're facing. There's also a shortage of engineers. Now, what is responsible for this? Is it that uh, the British do not want to do certain kinds of jobs? 
you know, because we're told that they don't, not many people are interested, for example, in meat processing. And that is what has led to the situation whereby drivers' wages have had to be increased. Who is going to blink for us? The retail commission, the logistics community, or the government? But that, by the way, is the comment. Now, my questions. Two, uh, Sajid Javid, the uh, health secretary, is asking for 2% tax, additional tax, I guess, on, uh, for social care. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Second, the spokesperson of the Taliban uh, yesterday uh, identified China as the uh, best ally of the Taliban. And uh, what does that mean in returns? Because uh, the spokesperson of the Taliban was saying that their economic issues will be addressed uh, by, uh, uh, by China. Copper mining, um, the uh, Bet Road Initiative, and even investments, and even loans coming from China. Would that solve the snobbery uh, from the West, from IMF, World Bank, and the United States that has decided to seize uh, assets, the foreign reserves, uh, in terms of assets in the United States belonging to Afghanistan? If China wants to get involved with the Taliban, then they will. They're already involved. They're already in the country, as you say, mining for, as we understand it, valuable metals within Afghanistan. If they want to get involved with the Taliban before we actually know what the Taliban stands for, whether it in fact is going to allow some of its some of the citizens who don't want to stay in Afghanistan to come out, whether they're going to meet and talk in terms that everybody can understand, not just in terrorist terms and not just in small organizational terms. But once the Chinese get in, as you found in Africa, they will they will lend money. They will they will help the development. Of course, they will. It's all it's part it's part of what they do. But don't don't get kidded by it. They will they will be after. It won't just be soft power that they that, that, that they they want to um, to take into countries, particularly into Afghanistan. It'll be money, and they and they will and and the, and the country will be indebted to China. And what will China actually take out of the country? These are the kind of questions that the Taliban actually needs to. Uh, need, need, needs to work on. National insurance is the tax you're talking about. The problem with national insurance, the problem with tax in this country is it's not hypothecated into different kind of pockets. So once it goes in, it's in the hands of civil servants as to how it comes out. I don't think rising um, rising taxes is, is a good idea, quite honestly, but it is in that, on a national insurance tax, which is different from income tax. And whether it will, if, if it goes directly to social services and provided somebody is actually looking to make sure that those social services are efficient in delivering what they're supposed to deliver, unlike the National Health Service, for example, then that's a good idea. But that isn't happening. Yeah, I asked you, you know, about the drivers and uh, whether the government is likely to shift uh, with regard to uh, short-term visas and allowing right, the, the, those the, companies to... The, uh, only thing that, the only thing that will make the drivers shift uh, opinion about that is us, the consumers, saying we're fed up with not being able to buy things and so on. I don't begrudge them the high salaries. Germany, France, Spain, Italy are, are having similar shortages as well. It's to do with people not wanting those, those those particular jobs. It's not just a British thing. I grant you that there are jobs that lazy British people don't want to do. Of course, it's the same everywhere in the world. You always have lazy parts of the population. I think, but my, my original reply to this, which was raised earlier in the program is do I think it's right that they're paid £60,000 a year? If that's what it takes, then yes, I do. Should the government be changing its plans? Yes, it should. Will it? I, I don't know. I, 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 have not, I don't have a political telescope, unfortunately. It, it should do if they're listening to the populace, and the populace will soon get fed up of rising prices and empty shelves. Well, does this have anything to do with the stimulus? Because if you stay at home and you just uh, collect... Uh, you know, advantages from the follow scheme. What would be the motivation for you to uh, do certain kinds of jobs? The furlough scheme is due to end on the 30th of September, and and universal credit boost, which was also given at that at that stage, will also go. So many families will find themselves looking for work. There are a million and a half um, un, un, unfilled, unskilled jobs. The point about HGV drivers, back to that, is it takes nine months apparently to train them. I don't know it. Apparently does. I, 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 I have no idea, but that, that's the figure I've been given. So therefore, if we, we're not going to solve that problem immediately. What would immediately solve the problem is, is immigration officials and immigration rules right. being shifted to allow skilled drivers right. into the country.
All right, uh, Michael, definitely you guys need the Nigerians. We'll learn how to drive in two weeks, not nine months. That nine months is too long. We'll get in the I truck in two weeks. Don't worry. We'll, we'll, do, we'll get it off for you, Michael. Thank you so much for your time.